So conceptualizing crime is a great example for us to work through the steps of conceptualization and operationalization. So as you recall, conceptualization and then conceptual definition and then operationalization and then measurements for that operational definition. Here it is. So as we said before, conception is a mental image we have about something. So when we think of crime, we all have a very different mental image. We could be imagining someone getting robbed or we could be imagining domestic violence or any other type of property crimes. There's such a large span when we're talking about crime. And so we come up with these words and phrases like I just did or symbols in order to further define the concept. And so crime is not something that we like collectively define in a way our government in a sense collectively defines it for us legislatively, but it's very much attached to a government structure whereas other abstract ideas are a little bit different and that they're not. And so Crime can be very different conceptually in different spaces. For example, marijuana legalization um, in some states, smoking marijuana is very much a crime and in others, it's like New Jersey, it's decriminalized. So it's not considered a crime anymore. So there's a lot of variability from county to county, state to state, city within state, county within state, which makes crime um, difficult to consistently measure. And crime changes over time. So alcohol prohibition is another example. Uh, there is a time in which we could not drink alcohol as well. And so crimes change over time. And they reflect our collective values. And we, as researchers, don't define crime, but in studying it, we deal with the fact that its definition is external. And criminologists also study social deviance and delinquency. So things that are seen as uh, taboo, but aren't necessarily illegal, right? Like people who uh, make money um, busking and um, playing music outside, right? That's not illegal, but is seen as like an alternative life practice. And so the official crime rate is sort of, I'm sure you've heard the metaphor that crime, the dark figure of crime is sort of like an iceberg and that everything underneath the iceberg is the dark figure and everything on top of it is the crime that we see. So Crime is very much measured through official crime rates, through policing. And there was this whole very much belief that crime was only committed by poor people for a long time. And so then there were um, different types of um, research designs that popped up that allowed us to measure crime in a different way. So victimization surveys where people interview the victims of crime, that gives us a larger scope of what crime might look like because sometimes we don't necessarily catch people who commit crimes, but sometimes we're just dealt with the victims of those crimes. Self-report surveys also allow us to um, see crimes that may occur that police don't necessarily know about. And so the first self-report surveys on crime really sort of broke a lot of new ground because people realized that people in the upper class actually do commit crimes. They just aren't necessarily caught for it in the same way. And so some crimes that are not captured in the crime rate that you usually see are type two, white collar crime, institutional crime, hate crime, and some things that are practically, so that's categorically excluded. Um, we measure those to a certain capacity, but when we're um, developing the crime rate, we don't include them. Practically excluded are crimes that no one calls the cops for, they just deal with it themselves. That's called self-help and that concept was developed by Black. Um, and then police-involved crimes we don't necessarily know about. 
Um, interpersonal violence is difficult to measure and is not often reported as well as sexual violence as well. And so sometimes we'll get some false positives, right? Because people call the cops and maybe they think that a crime was committed, but they actually it wasn't committed. So that's a false positive. And sometimes we get false negatives. So there may have been, so false negatives is when there uh, was a crime, but it was not reported. So the practically excluded can be a part of those false negatives as well. And so this just gives you a sense of how difficult it can be to measure something, especially something that's so broad conceptually as crime is. So composite measures allow us to combine individual measures to produce more valid results. So when we're dealing with like disorganization or crime in particular, we can take measurements from a bunch of different aspects of that in order to understand the variability within it. And so indexes and scales are efficient ways for us to do that. So an index would be like if we're measuring disorder and we have a checklist of different things that might indicate disorder, then that would be an index or a scale would be like a range of possible um, outcomes. And so our crime, crime rate is a number of index crimes. So particular crimes where we check off that those crimes have been committed divided by the population in times 100,000. And so this is based off of UCR data, which is developed by police um, um, reporting. And so what happens is that this is an unweighted index. So murder counts the same as arson. And the crime rate is used to describe an area, a neighborhood, a municipality. So it is geographically bound. And when it's geographically bound, that's also shown to reflect the amount of policing in those neighborhoods too. So there's sort of an issue in that if there's a lot of police deployment in a particular area, then there's going to be more reports of crime, even if there are not, even if a neighborhood might have a similar amount of crime, but there's not as much police deployment. So that it gets to issues around those areas. And there's a lot of political incentives for like police chiefs to want to address the crime rate to say that they reduced it within their term. And so there can be some political sway in how the crime rate is developed. And there's also, a lot of private police forces that we don't necessarily know how they influence the crime being reported as well. And that could be a cool study if anyone would be interested in doing that. Um, and we're not including white collar crime in here as well. And so what unit of analysis is the crime rate? You can take a pause for a second, think about it. But it's definitely groups. So it's neighborhoods, it's geographic areas. So it's multiple people with the same characteristic and the same characteristics is we live in a certain municipality or um, census track region. So most of these measures are based off of police records and certain types are detected almost exclusively by observation. So traffic and victimless crimes. Um, and so some crimes are not measured very well, like assaults and robberies. And there's, like I said, deployment on influences this and also people's willingness to call police. So the UCR is a measure of crime that we use and particularly for the crime rate. If you're interested more in just understanding homicide in particular, there's the supplemental whole homicide reports, which gives more information about the incidents. Then there's also the national incident-based reporting system, which does not have the hierarchy rule. So it actually um, gives multiple crimes if there was like 
the hierarchy rule is like if there's multiple crimes that occur in the same space then the worst crime is going to be the one that's reported whereas in the national incident based reporting system all of the crimes that happen in a particular space are going to be reported and so it also gives more of a sense of who the offenders and victims were and has more quality control. And so there's been this whole push for law enforcement agencies to shift to the national incident-based reporting system. And so these are the part one offenses and the part two offenses. So as you see, the um, crime rate that we're traditionally aware of is just including the part one offenses. So vandalism, prostitution, drug abuse violations, gambling, none of those are included in the crime rate. And so these are some of the surveys I was talking about that really broke ground in us understanding crime as more of a universal thing that happens. So there's the National Crime Victimization Survey, Community Victimization Surveys, there's the National Survey in Drug, Use and Health, and the Monitoring the Future Report. And so if you are interested in studying crime, these are some good data sources to look into. Um, and there's some drug surveillance systems in particular. And so, like we said, sometimes there's diversion programs. And so these crimes are not gonna be shown in the crime rate, but if these are particular crimes you're interested in, you can look into these databases. And so based off of your interests, if you're interested in murder and crimes in which a victim is a business or commercial establishment, the UCR and SHR are good sources. Crimes against persons or households that are not reported to the police, the NCVS is a good one. And those that don't have readily identifiable victims and are less observed self-report surveys are great for that. So when you're thinking about crime yourself, you want to think of how you're operationalizing it, what your unit of analysis is, and for what purpose. If you want to measure the impacts of an agency, like if you want to know if your police department's doing well, then maybe there are particular measures that you're focused on. If you're wanting to monitor crime in a particular area, you might have a different conceptualization or if you want to do research. Here's that image again. So dimensions are specific aspects of a concept and crime can be subdivided into dimensions. So there's violent, nonviolent, delinquency, victimless, spatial. Indicators are victim, conviction, property damage, reporting. So as we see here, specification leads to deeper understanding. And so crime can be both a dependent variable and an independent variable. So it could be, um, they're looking into how socioeconomic status causes crime and crime can also be an independent variable. So how crime affects fear and other attitudes. So a person's attributes on one variable are expected to cause or encourage particular attributes on another variable. This is causation. So oftentimes as criminal justice researchers, we're trying to understand the exact causes of crime. And just an overview, an independent variable is what influences the dependent variable. Um, so an example of us Conceptualizing something is the socioeconomic status. So we think of that as sort of your standing within society, your class, and that allows us to figure out, okay, how can we observe that? And so in actuality, when people are usually talking about SCS, they're talking about a composite measure of education, income, type of occupation, and place of residence. So it's like sort of a checklist of these different types of things and ranking them in order. And so that allows us to take this abstract notion of class and really define it and get the full range of possibilities within it. So it's exhaustive, 
in including everything that we would need to assess something like that. And it's uh, reliable and being consistent because we've defined it prior. So you can see that the, within this example, this table, this is SCS index options for the NCVS. So you see that, that there are different types of indexes. So based off of your research, you might want to adjust and use some or not. So maybe you're thinking about housing and you want to include it, or maybe you're dealing with people who are more um, transient, so you don't want to include housing in it. And so this is an example of an index in which we're taking a exhaustive range of like education, income, employment, housing. These are the exhaustive uh, parts of class, right? And we're really defining them in a way in which there's a checklist. And so there can only be one measure within each of these spaces and a possible range or scale. And so it allows us to quantify that in a way that is systematic. And you see here, based off of what, which one we choose, we might get different rates of violent crime. So we see here how just changing our composite, changing our index can actually change the outcomes that we have. And we often develop indexes uh, for disorder, as I talked and alluded to earlier. So physical disorder might be abandoned buildings, broad garbage and litter. And so we would check off those particular things seen in a physical area. So those were two examples of indexes and um, sort of the difficulties in measuring crime and trying to apply concepts and operationalizing these larger concepts of crime into things that we can measure tangibly.